Hi, I'm senior programmer Jen Wilson, and welcome to this film independent, independent presents Q and A for the HBO documentary "The Fastest Woman on Earth" by Graham Swarsa and Christopher Otwell. Uh, special thanks to lead sponsor Hef Hefka and our virtual screenings partner Vision Media. And now, please welcome our guests, the directors of The Fastest Woman on Earth, Graham Swarsa and Christopher Otwell. Welcome. Thanks thank for you. Having us. Yeah. Thank you. Um, so we uh, at Film Independent, um, our a lot of many of our members are um, aspiring filmmakers um, or aspiring to do other things in the film industry. Can you suit to sort of um, give us a glimpse into how you got into filmmaking? Um, we'll start with Graham. Sure. Um, so it started young. I mean. <clears throat> Uh, from an early age, we were the first house on the block to have a video camera. It was when they were tethered to a VCR and you had to kind of like haul the thing around and 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 it was a two-part camera. We were the very last house to have a microwave, but somehow <laughs> the video camera was a was a first thing in our family. And from a young age, I just really loved finding perspective and capturing moments. And um, so, you know, went to film school and even through that was looking to tell stories about travel. You know, I had spent time in Africa and wanted to bring home kind of stories from the the remote village where I was staying. Um, and I interviewed for a job once and they said, you know, it was for an automotive um, kind of car series. And they said, have you ever shot a car going 60 miles an hour around a canyon? And I said, no, but I've shot a cheetah on the Savannah running 60 miles chasing a gazelle. And they said, okay, great, you got the job. <laughs> It kind of veered off into this automotive world, which, as you can imagine, you know, with this film kind of took um, us in, in that action adventure um, path. And, and Chris and I, through that, um, started working together and, and formed a really deep partnership as a, as a result. Yeah, I'm from a similar era, the, the, the VHS age, you know, of uh, getting your hands on a camera and making a movie in your bedroom or whatever. Um, yeah, kind of kind of a similar, you know, you pick up a camera and it just feels natural. The storytelling felt natural. I grew up with movies. And, and so, yeah, it was sort of in my bones. I was a theater kid. Uh, I went and got a film degree and um, at Florida State and came out of Florida State making movies on 16 millimeter, you know, spending a, a, a fortune making really bad movies, you know. Uh, this was ahead of the digital revolution, you know, and so it's been kind of an amazing thing to watch the tools change in such a way that you can, you can make legit movies for next to nothing now. I know we couldn't before. Um, what I learned through that process was that I wasn't a great screenwriter. I was under the illusion that I was a kind of auteur. I was going to write my own stories and direct and, and just control everything and edit and, and all of that. And I, I discovered that I was a really lousy screenwriter and, and I was much better at telling stories that were taken from reality, stories that actually happened to people I knew, stories that happened to me. And uh, much like Graham going off and finding adventure, to me, uh, documentary filmmaking was an extension of, um, if there's not a story for me to tell right in front of me, I'm gonna go live one. You know, I'm gonna, I'm gonna pick up my camera and I, I'm gonna go, you know, step beyond my boundaries out into the world and 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 hope that something interesting happens uh, and graham has a great expression doing automotive uh, uh, uh material where he says um you know any car is exciting at its limit whether you're in a lamborghini or in you're like a 3200 bucket any car at its limit is is dramatic right so same thing with lives anybody pushing their own limits anybody kind of stepping beyond their norm um there's a story there you know, yeah. and we, we all hopefully, you know, touch that every day in some some yeah. small way, you know. And just to add on that, that's an important point for our filmmaking culture, I think, is we expect that and encourage that with our team and our crew members. You know, what do you want to learn today? What can you what limits can you push today? Because if we're all growing and learning, there's no blame. There's only support. Right. Um, if someone is, you know, someone's out on the skinny branches for their ability or their their instinct or, you know, experience, uh, you create a culture of support rather than, 
blame and 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 shame you know and so it really we find that that's that's a huge part of our team culture as filmmakers we were shooting an episode of, of the list which is the show where we met jesse and, and and graham and i collaborated on the show you know we were in england shooting at the um aston shop where they restore all the uh, the old original bond aston martins and stuff and and we had a cool episode there and in with our usual method and our usual vibe and our team is very tight we travel and it's like a family and so we just bring our method to it and at the end of it they were like we've never dealt with a crew that didn't just scream at each other for 45 minutes before they started <laughs> shooting you know like these british union crew crews roll in and they just have to debate the heck out of everything before anything happens and we were just so cash and hopefully left everybody better than we found them you know sure. and then at the end of the day they were very very happy with the um, with the material we created too so so, uh, so you mentioned that you worked on uh, uh, Jesse's show. Is is that part of how you came to make this film about her? Yeah. So, <clears throat> I was hired. Uh, uh, wow, 12, 15 years ago, twelve plus years ago, to uh, create a series. It was called The List: A Thousand and One Car Things to Do Before You Die, and it was originally intended to be a car show for car guys. And that just felt really rote, you know, and, and so we said, well, what if it's what if it's a um, what if the expert is a woman who is like deep in this field and it's a <clears throat> action adventure series rather than a car show? I mean, it's more accessible when we think, are you a car guy or not? It's it's kind of like, well, for me, that means like a tank of gas and some time and some friends like, yeah, I'm a car guy. I want to go on a road trip. I want to seek adventure. That was always the thing that like thrusts you through the world right and so that's that's the intention we set out with but so intentionally we were looking to to um audition women to, to be the expert on the team and jesse walked into the audition um we had kind of known about her from her previous tv experience on overhaul and then and she was on mythbusters for a while and she walked in the room and it was just like magnetic she just had energy and personality and and most importantly experience deep experience hands-on welding um great mechanic great builder fabricator she just was the real deal um and you know and we chose jesse and as the host of the show and what we come to find out and what anyone that knows her finds out is that she actually chooses you right like she's auditioning you she's vetting you and 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 um she chose us and 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 so to kind of complete the the cycle about two years into the show she came to me and said you know graham i have this opportunity um i don't know what it means for this show but i'm wondering if it could maybe be a part of it i was invited to be the driver of the north american eagle land speed car and they're looking to break the world record um the female land speed record, which has been in place since 1976. And it's something I think I want to do. And so she pursued that on her own and kind of caught her own bug with, with how she wanted that to express itself in the world for being a mentor for young women. And we went, um, we, we, we got permission to follow and, and film um, her first attempts to, at the land speed record in 2013. And when Chris and I hit the lake bed for the first time to see this 12 mile expanse of pure flat playa and this car built from a, a, a repurposed fighter jet from the 50s and this team of like volunteer engineers and, 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 and aviation enthusiasts, it was like, this is happening in one place on the planet with one team with this one woman. And it just so happens that, that we're all in this together. And it was like, uh, it was a paradigm shift in kind of that when that story and world presents itself to you, it, you know, you, you, you keep going. So how do you actually film something like this? Like what are the conditions out in the Albert desert in Oregon where they were doing these um, speed tests? The Alvord is the first thing to know about it is that it's, it's, a hundred miles from the closest civilization. And we use the term loosely. I mean, it's in the middle of nowhere. It's very hard to get to. It's like a solid 15, 16 hours of driving from, from Los Angeles. Um, and so 
you know, it's, it, it might as well be Nepal or, or Africa, or, I mean, it feels very, very remote, You're very much on an expedition. Uh, there are very few services out there. There's a hot spring um, because the, the, the land is very volcanic out there. Um, um, it's on the Pacific Rim. You know, if you look at a map of Oregon, it's all these volcanoes that kind of dot the land and it's, it's sort of in that line. And, and so there's this incredible kind of mysterious energy to the place because it is very, you know, tectonically active and, 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 you know, water boils up from underneath and there's a 10,000 foot mountain, Steens Mountain. It's literally 10,000 feet on your left and to the right, it's like 4,000 feet. So it's a 6,000 foot differential. And so it's just very extreme. The weather reflects that, um, it, you know, it, it can be very hot and, and dry one day and the next day clouds roll in and you think, oh my God, it's going to rain. And when it does rain, it turns the, the surface to absolute muck and you can't accomplish anything. And yeah. um, the, the, the seasonal kind of uh, variations out there are always why the teams are up against very limited windows that they can accomplish this feat because there's only certain seasons you can go. Permitting is very difficult. Um, you know, it's um, the condition of the lake bed obviously varies from year to year. And some years you just can't do it. Literally, there were years where we were like, are we going out this year? Like, nope. <laughs> Sand yeah. is too soft. Like, come back next year. Yeah. And, and it I, distorts your sense, just like the space of the place distorts your sense of scale. Right. The endeavor distorts your sense of time. Like, what's a lot of time to think we're going to accomplish this goal? Like, we had to completely recalibrate, like, our concept of how long it would take. And from a from a filmmaking standpoint, a capture standpoint, you know, I, I think I would I would narrow it down to three or four main factors, which which are, you know, you've got a 12 mile expanse that you need to cover when that car leaves mile zero, it's going eight to 12 miles down, down range, right? Uh, at, you know, 400 plus 500 plus miles an hour. And so what takes her a couple minutes to get down there, uh, takes us, if we went hundred miles an hour, it's a 12 minute drive, right. To go get her, um, to meet up with her. So coverage, right. You can have people at mile zero. You can have people at, as she drives by, maybe a drone in the air and people at the end, but otherwise it's catch as catch can, um, the dust, the talcum powder kind of playa dust gets in everything and it will stay in everything forever. <laughs> if anyone's been to burning man or, you know, yeah. Uh, it that's it. It's got that that tingle to it. You know you've touched something that was on the plyo when your fingers start to tingle. So it it, it gets on the um. The yeah, we're all completely gray when we walk away. I've got a great picture of Graham, and he's just a gray person, <laughs> completely gray. Yeah. And now I'm gray for different reasons, but <laughs> and then and then the camera's in the car, right? Uh, for us, it was extremely important, and this is where we leaned on our automotive experience um, and and action adventure um filmmaking uh, filming is that those cameras had to be secure that our cameras could not be the reason something went wrong in that cockpit when they came undone or um or fell or were in her line of sight or anything and so we were really conscientious about where we placed cameras and how safe they were and even still the vibration in that vehicle at those speeds was unthreading the um the rigging you know, all the hardware we could throw and at everything and then <laughs> slowly turn and, um, and, and, uh, it actually became part of the creative just to show that like the forces at work in this endeavor are now, the okay. failure of the cameras. It's much the same when you're trying to object like that at 500 miles an hour on a 500 millimeter lens, half a mile away. I got it. I got it. Oh, I lost it. <laughs> it's gone. And then in an instant, you have to catch up. So there's that moment where the camera catches up to it because the thing is too yeah. fast for any camera operator and the vibrations are too strong for any camera rigging. So again, the limits are where it's exciting. Right. You know, and, and a lot of that makes the cut, these imperfections where things fail. It's like it just kind of shows you the forces at work. It feels like very high stakes filmmaking also because you can't you can't say, hey, let's do another take. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. something like that <coughs> um, i noticed there was some aerial was that all done with drones or did you have helicopter or planes or mm. so the first year the team had a partner come out in a helicopter and that's the thing this whole team was in the no, it was a fixed wing plane yeah oh that's right that's right <clears throat> 
Um, so be, given that this team is in the aviation field, I mean, they had friends flying out and dropping down on the lake bed. And so there were just planes around that would stop in to visit to us. That was, you know, just kind of novel. But yeah, um, Wolf Aviation, um, a, a, a company out of L.A. that 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 does some um, um, aerial videography, filmmaking, things like that, they were out uh, as a means of supporting the team and, and they filmed um, in 2013 and then in subsequent years we we brought drones out and we're filming um yeah it's an interesting distinction between the two the the fixed wing aircraft gave us a speed that you can't get with a drone the drone you know is drones are great but they only travel so fast and so far and uh you, there's i mean even even the the full-on aircraft is not going to keep up with this this car on the ground but in, in flying sort of parallel with it and letting it pass it created some really interesting uh, dynamics whereas a drone you're yeah. just kind of parked and the car goes by and it's, you know, you're, you're kind of limited with how you can track it. So that was an interesting you know, thing to learn about. Uh, so early on, we sort of, you know, view the, the history of the, the supersonic, the, the race to, um, you know, build the fastest car and, and do the fastest ride. And so the, it was the, it was the Brits with their supersonic car that went, mm -hmm. was it 800? miles per hour close to it 763 was their official number yeah and just looking at that footage i'm like okay this car and this team and all of it looks like it's an elon musk type uh situation with a lot of money yeah yep. and so it's very astute when, by the way yeah thank you yeah <laughs> when, you're, when you're looking at the situation with uh jesse's team um and a lot of it being, you know, they didn't have a lot of funding and they're just like converting, you know, a, a jet plane and getting like volunteer. I'm just like, this is absolutely crazy. Did you feel that? Did you um, sort of feel like, instantly. why do these people want to do that? What do you think attracts them to do this? The, the word we're constantly coming to is audacity. The audacity yeah. of this dream to think that it's even possible that this could be done. Uh, the history of land speed racing is generally like pretty well funded, well sponsored teams. Craig Breedlove in the 60s had good years sponsoring his runs. They would camp out for months out at Bonneville and like the resources were really piled into it because people were paying attention. Yeah. And even as late as the 90s, somebody was still watching when this thing was going on. And so the 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 um, the English government actually supports the, the land speed initiative as a kind of um, science, education, mathematics uh, um, um, research and education initiative. So there's a lot of public funding in it matched with private, it's complicated, but um, a, lot of, a lot of money put into it. And, and these guys, yeah, they, 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 they were building a car and, and, and when the, the Brits went supersonic, their car was just junk, they couldn't use it anymore. And so suddenly these drag racers are like, well, how do we take that step into this stratospheric you know, realm that we haven't even touched it, we don't have the money, we don't have the technology, we, you were building it from scratch. And this just one moment of what if yeah. from Ed, like what if we took this perfect old plane, you know, without, but took the wings off and put wheels on. I mean, it's, it's like, it's yeah. asinine. Yeah. And they were at it for, you know, 15 plus years pri prior to us even stepping foot into their world. And, and when and the car so runs, it's like, it's a miracle that this yeah. car does what it does. I, well, yeah. I think the sponsorship conversation <laughs> mirrors the filmmaking conversation, right? Because Chris and I reached out maybe, you know, to, to seek funding and, and a couple of years into the process. And it's like, okay, well, how long is it going to take? We don't know. How much is it going to cost? We don't know. <laughs> Call us when it's done, right? And, and, and so the same for sponsorship for this team. It was, or any team <clears throat> pursuing this, which there's only two others in the world that we know of. But um, yeah, you, 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 you get one shot a year. It costs a ton of money to go out and do it production and you know right you're you're just like one go here we go um and if it fails it's another year of tweaking tinkering and the whole thing but yeah this team the knowledge and heart um they're all you know engineers and av builders and they, they all have this skill and under ed's leadership um they all made this happen and it's just incredible they've got a lot to be proud of for for what they were actually able to accomplish over the years 
I think it's a, it's a, it's both an aviation mentality and a racer's mentality. This idea that give me a roll of duct tape and some JB weld and we can make this thing go. Um, and, and then the, the, the military, you know, these guys are all, a lot of them are ex-military and certainly ex-military. There's the sense of the mission has to be accomplished. There, you know, failure is not an option. Like whatever you must bring to it, you, you have to. And when you put that, those two sensibilities together, then things actually happen. And then people start to believe. And now you have a group that's believing. I mean, that it, it gets exponentially more effective. And, and, and that's kind of where we stepped in. The team had been testing the car and building the car for like 15 years by the time we actually saw it run the first time. So we got to show up and be awestruck by it yeah. and not really know all the details of what went into it. But once you find out how audacious this dream was, it, uh, um, I mean, you, how can you not make a movie out of it? Uh, as so, uh, you know, I'm a person who's like uh, not a gearhead, but I my my whole entire family are NASCAR fans and and gearheads. My dad and my brother love cars and motorcycles, and um, so they, you know, watch a lot of this. And so watching this, I think that um, it was hard for me to fathom just how dangerous everything really was because you have this concept that they're out in the desert where there's miles and miles and miles, of nothing. So what's she going to crash into or, you know, what's really going to be the danger. So I feel like I was pretty shocked um, when the end came and she actually did die. Um, can you talk about what, did you have a concept of that was like a large possibility when you were making this film? Yeah, when we went out in 2013, we were oblivious to this whole thing. It was like, oh, these guys are pros. They've got it handled. The car is great. Everything's going to be great. What could go wrong? But it's it's a weird thing that happens, too, with, um, you know, in life, our minds do this thing where we envision the worst so that we can file it away and put it behind us. Like your kid running out into the street, right? As soon as they can walk, it's like you envision them running out in the street and you kind of file that. And that's what happened in 2013. When I first saw that car go, in my brain, I saw it kite and kind of take off and just go catastrophic. And then when we drove the 10 miles to get to her and she's there, smiles, the, the engine's cooling down, the whole thing, it was just like, oh, okay, file that away. Um, it was always a possibility and the stakes were always high, but on that particular run that you're talking about, you know, my experience was coming down the lake bed to find her, to reveal that reality had kind of jumped the tracks into that first scenario that I saw many years ago in 2013 in my mind. And all I could say was, okay, okay, you know, I, okay, I've seen this before. I knew it was a possibility and I can't actually process it in this moment it was definitely a state of shock um in kind of having that be a reality and having to immediately face it and come to terms with the fact that it, it had actually happened and, and not knowing the outcome so still in my mind i saw the team you know with the like soldier carry with her arms over two people walking away from the scene or i envisioned me visiting her in the hospital sitting bedside going oh my god that was crazy you know you hold on to this stuff as long as you can until you actually find uh the truth yeah and i kept telling myself that uh kitty o'neill survived a crash at 300 some odd miles an hour and that was foremost in my mind when when we didn't know what had happened on that run it was like that oh, kitty kitty made it out so i was kind of holding on to that um and, and in that sense you can't show up and film the 15 or however many runs we had done you know prior to that without every time flipping that switch and saying no this is gonna be okay this is gonna be okay it's gotta be it's gotta be okay and jesse speaks to that in the movie you can't you can't get in to do these things without, you know, the risk it's there, you file it and, and you, you have to believe deep down that like, it's going to be okay. Yeah. Oh, well, watching the movie a second time, uh, the scene where um, Jesse asked Kitty, um, you know, why did you quit? Why did you stop doing it? And Kitty says too many of my friends died. Mm -hmm. And I was just like, 
the foreboding. I didn't realize like that's wow. the forebode. It's like, wow. Yeah. It, oh. yeah. I'm glad you watched it again because it is, you know, that's, I, 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 there is so much in there throughout the whole film that, that, that you know, I, I hope that people do watch it multiple times because it only serves to have you appreciate the choices she made the whole way yeah. of step in, lean in, step in, empower, face, you know, face fears, be courageous. It only makes her more powerful knowing the full cycle she traveled. Yeah, I think it's um, when you watch something like NASCAR or Formula One or any of these other things that people are watching now, it's easy to forget that aspect. Yeah. So easy to forget how how extremely dangerous it really is. Yeah. Well, um, yeah, sorry. Ahead, sorry. I was going to say, I think things with uh, motorsports and racing, you know, everyone wants to go, am I a car person or not? And, and, and what we've found is it's, it's really the human behind the wheel that these are people that want to iterate and be better. And they're, they're, they're um, uh, fanatical about improvement and betterment and, and uh, technique. And, and so the racing part is just how it expresses itself. You know, a lot of these people, if it expressed itself in other ways in the world, it would be through art or music or something else. Like, you know, Jesse did leather work and uh, building motorcycles and welding and fabricating. It's like, she was just always about being better than she was yesterday and being an example for others that because she, in her words, was average, if I can do it, you can too. And so right. I think it's just, you know, we really grew to understand racing as really an, an expression of people just wanting to be better, uh, better selves than they were yesterday. So, uh, so when does this film actually come out? October 20th. October 20th. HBO Max. And, yeah. Um, what is next for the for the two of you? Do you work together on a lot of projects? Uh, we've been working together for a long time. So yeah, yeah we're, we're yeah. looking to the next one for sure. Um, yeah. yeah. Do you think you would do anything on this subject matter again? Um, I, um, I think humans pursuing um, greatness and people pushing their limits. So I think, you know, our, 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 the next film that we're, we're really um, jumping into now is, is, is um, looking to kind of feature someone who really um, pushed their, their boundaries in, in order to accomplish something that they had in their mind that they, they needed to do in this world. Um, yeah. And, you know, helping to share those stories as, um, and all the complications that come yeah. with it. Yeah. Yeah. It's <laughs> Next not character pretty... is very complicated, yeah, but a yeah. similar concept. One character kind of putting themselves against their capabilities in the universe and the, and the complications that come with it. Yeah, We still have some work to do before we can talk about it. So, Yeah. Well, I'm looking forward to, to seeing it. You converted me to mm -hmm. things about uh, racing in space. It was, it's a fascinating film. And I really enjoyed getting to know Jessie uh, and really, you know, celebrate her accomplishments, um, which are amazing. And uh, thank you, you know, uh, good luck to you guys. And thank you so much for, for coming to talk about the film. Thank you, appreciate it. Thanks, Thanks for having us.